Yes, so for the last session, we have two papers. The first one is titled Ronojit Guho Works Insights Lessons by Ishita Banerjee Dube. And the second one is titled The Small Voice of History, within quotes, Termites and Dehumanization in British India by Rohan Dev Roy. For this session, we have Professor Srila Roy as the chair. Uh, Professor Srila Roy is Professor of Sociology at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. Her long-standing research interests and expertise is in the field of transnational and decolonial feminist studies. Professor Roy is the author of Remembering Revolution and Changing the Subject, Feminist and Queer Politics in Neoliberal India and the editor of New South Asian Feminisms, among other texts. She has held visiting fellowships at the Delhi School of Economics, the Institute of Economic Growth, Delhi, the University of Johannesburg, the Universidad de Valparaiso in Chile, the Universities of Bergen and Oslo, Norway, and, and been a writing fellow at the Johannesburg Institute of Advanced Studies and at the Rockefeller Center in Bellagio, Italy. Uh, we are very thankful to Professor Roy for sparing her time and agreeing to share this session for us. So I'll invite her to the dais now and hand over the proceedings to her. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm sure I'm audible. Um, just to say, I, as the last session, thank you to Upal and the, and the team at Presidency for taking us through such a rich and generative day. Uh, this is the last session, so thank you to the audience for still being with us. Uh, this session is going to be as uh, rich as the entire day has been. We have two wonderful speakers, which I'm going to, I'm going to introduce both of them to you now. Uh, and uh, Professor Banerjee Dube will go first and then followed by um, uh, Dr. Dave Roy. Uh, Ishita Banerjee Dube is Professor of History at the Center for Asian and African Studies and also at the Center for Gender Studies at the College of Mexico. She has held the D.D. Kosambi Visiting Chair of Inter Interdisciplinary Studies in Goa University and has been a fellow at the Max Weber College uh, Erfurt University, Germany. She's also held visiting professorships uh, at a number of places, including Ecuador, um, the University of Syracuse in New York, and here in Jadapur uh, at the School of Women's Studies. Uh, she's been a fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, amongst others, and her research explores a range of issues, including religion, law and power, time and temporality, language and identity, gender and nation, food and emotion, democracy and social justice. She's authored several books, including A History of Modern India, Religion, Law and Power, Divine Affairs, and in Spanish, and I'm not going to butcher the title, Borders of Hinduism. Uh, so welcome, Professor Banerjee Dubey. I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Deb Roy as well, but we'll hear from you first. Um, hi, Rohan Deb Roy uh, is Associate Professor in South Asian History at the University of Reading. His academic interests include histories of science and medicine, histories of empire and colonialism, environmental history and animal history. He's authored a malarial subject, Empire, Medicine and Non-Humans in British India, 1820. To 1909 and co-edited Locating the Medical Explorations in South Asian History. He's also co-edited a special issue on non-human empires for the Journal of Comparative Studies of South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Deb Roy received his PhD from University College London and held postdoctoral fellowships at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences here in, in Kolkata, at the University of Cambridge, and at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin. And he's also been uh, a Bernard Columbia Weiss International Visiting Scholar in the History of Science. Welcome, Dr. Deb Roy. Um, over to you. Thanks a lot, uh, Srila, for the introduction. Thanks to all of you, particularly the organizers, Upal and Shukonya, and a co-conspirator who actually got us in, involved at the very last minute. Um, and in particular, I'd like to mention the student volunteers who've taken such good care of us right from the main gate, you know, starting from accompanying us from the main gate and to taking care of us so when we were having lunch to looking after our computers. <laughs> so I would, yes, I do want to express my uh, thanks to them, yes. We've come at the end of a long day of very intense discussion and uh, I think we're all tired. So I, I will try not 
to burden your minds further. Also, because as I said, since we got uh, incorporated at the very last minute, I'll probably share my anecdotes. And uh, I've, you know, the early volumes of Sir Walton Studies came out when I was an undergraduate. And then, you know, we had Gautam Bhadra as a teacher from, from our master's uh, days. And I did my PhD at the Center for Studies in Social Sciences. So I'll, I'll kind of share what I learned from, you know, elementary aspects of Walton studies and try and, you know, mix them a little with, with my personal encounters with Ranajit Babu, but also with the, some of the other members of Subaltern Studies. So with that brief introduction, I'll begin, I'll begin with our very last and recent meeting with Ranajit Babu this July and take you back in time. Okay. So words are, and, and it's very interesting that we've spoken about words and language and the care in the use of words, you know, in, in subaltern studies in general, but in Ranjit Guha in particular, beginning with Parthola. So I'll begin with a very evocative uh, phrase he used. Words are all I am, stated Ranajit Babu poignantly. Toward the end of an almost three hour long conversation, Saurav and I were very fortunate to have with him and Mekhtil Guha in July this year. Ranajit Babu had taken us to his study and was showing us all the lexicons and dictionaries he had on his table. And he was speaking to Saurav, that's another thing. He just misses speaking in Bengali. And he was like continuously, Egulo dakho, Egulo dakho, ami bolche. That's why words are all I am. These words and the tears in his eyes as we left them resonated with us during our way back to Vienna from Purkersdorf. We barely spoke during that short journey. Interestingly, Saurav and I understood these touching and meaningful words in English differently. I leave it to Saurav to relate his understanding tomorrow. For, for me, these words meant a simultaneous self-constitution and deconstruction on the part of a brilliant thinker and teacher towards the end of his life. Shomoy boro kom, he said. He told me as I bowed down to touch his feet and because he had tears in his eyes, we said, if we come back to Europe, uh, you know, next year we'll come visit you again from wherever we are in Europe. He said, Shomoy Boroko. So I'll return to the significance of words and the great care in the use of words and language in Ranajit Guha's works very soon. Let me first take you back to the early 1980s when the first volume of Subaltern Studies and Elementary Aspects of Peasant Insurgency were published, one in 82, one in 1983. As raw undergraduates, we received the news of these publications from our teachers with enthusiasm, but found elementary aspects to be a little beyond our ken at that stage. It was as MS students of Calcutta University with economic history as special paper when Professor Binoy Bhushan Choudhury made us read and submit written assignments on each individual chapter of elementary aspects that we began engaging with it seriously, grudging the assignments and yet getting the flavor of the incisive ideas express, expressed in apt and accurate language. Language and ideas that required slow reading multiple readings and mulling over. Little by little, we began to understand the, the acute importance of care in the choice of words used to express ideas and arguments. And our excitement grew as our vista was open to the very suggestive ways of reading colonial records that offered totally unexpected <laughs> insights. To give just an instance, we were thrilled to discover that the use of words such as contagion or epidemic in reports of colonial of, of officials to describe the spread of insurgencies signaled a denial of consciousness of subordinate subjects who were, who were the actors in such uprisings. This 
together with the analysis of modes of communication and transmission of messages in pre-literate worlds that established or non-literate worlds, not pre-literate, sorry, non-literate worlds, literate within quotes, of course, in non-literate worlds that enabled the spread of insurgencies opened a new world of approaching historical events and processes a previously unthought of way of understanding, and I quote, the facts of the matter, an issue that we know have troubled historians, you know, continuously, the facts of the matter. So this was, this opened to us a new way of approaching the uh, facts of the matter and innovative ways of narrating those facts. I'm, I'm going to the debate in history between action and narr narration. Huh? facts of the matter and, and a narration of those facts. So, <clears throat> okay, an issue that has troubled historians for long. Uh, okay, the appeal of this creative impulse of pluralizing facts, as our friend Ajay Karya elegantly stated earlier today, in order to imaginatively evoke events and processes of everyday social lives, seems to have endured. And here I'll give you an, uh, an anecdote. I remember writing to Shahid Amin some years back to find out more about the significance of the circulation of chapatis prior to 1857. For those who have read elementary aspects carefully would, would know what I'm referring to. The circulation of chapatis prior to 1857. I had to write to Shahid Amin to find out more about the significance of this circulation because a few of our master's students were totally enthralled by the idea that you one could understand that something is going to happen, a world in turmoil, yet nobody knows, you know, it's a poised on the brink. Understandably, Shahid did not respond. I mean, what could he write? But I did write, you know, following up on my students' enthusiasm. So <laughs> I couldn't write to Ravnajit Babu, of course, so I wrote to, yeah. So the use of the subaltern as the other of the elite in Guha's structuralist argument, and more importantly, the affirmation that negation was the prime element of subaltern consciousness, where the sub subaltern defines himself, of course, this point has been made so clearly by Gayatri, so where the subaltern defines himself, I've added herself in parenthesis, in oppositional relation to the oppressor, allowed us to understand hierarchical, asymmetrical relations of power in social relations. A comprehension consolidated by the eloquent explanation related by means of changes in modes of addressing the superior, the switch from apni to tui, the defiant use of symbols reserved for the dominant as expressions of subaltern resistance and non-conformity with the established word uh, order at particular moments. The combined effect of the different dense chapters of elementary aspects was that of a revelation. Attention to apparently simple facts largely ignored in history writing till then could offer insights of such immense significance. We learned what to pay attention to, how to read and see, and tried, mostly unsuccessfully, because we were constantly under the shashon, the kora bokuni of uh, Gautamda in our master's, yes, <laughs> economic history special paper, yeah, the seven of us. So, um, <laughs> so we tried, <laughs> mostly <laughs> unsuccessfully, to express our ideas clearly and carefully, because language, Pay attention to language, you know? Think carefully before you write, were, you know, the constant admonitions. And I'll give you another example that I mentioned yesterday. I'd written in one of my term papers, uh, something was complex. So Gautamda tells me, give me an instance of something other than an amoeba, amoeba that's not complex. So the point was, you are actually not saying anything. You cannot describe it, you can't define it, so you're using complex. Huh? So, <laughs> um, so, so we tried most almost always unsuccessfully to express our ideas clearly and carefully. Elementary aspects and the manifesto of subordinate studies in the first volume that underlined and 
elitist bias in nationalist historiography and declared a new agenda for history and historiography induced a few of us interested in following up the masters with research that would give us the opportunity of draw, drawing upon these new lessons and try to have access to and learn from the quotidian lives of subordinate groups and restore them, very naive of course, and restore them as sovereign subjects of history. Evidently, elementary aspects and several other writings of Ranajit Babu and those of the members of the collective had much more to offer than what I have indicated so far. It was much later that I understood the, <clears throat> uh, the subaltern studies critique of the denial of consciousness of the subaltern as the basis of their important argument about widening and changing the notion of the political, affirming the presence of an informal sphere of the political where mobilization was horizontal and not vertical, uh, a sphere uh, that was autonomous of the institutional sphere of politics and yet impinged upon it in the sense that the institutional political needed this informal autonomous political, but not vice versa. All these things have been analyzed and criticized, but I'm just trying to say the insights that we got that, you know, encouraged us then. More significantly, in focusing on the peasant as the ideal representative of the subaltern in colonial India, and in insisting that the subaltern was a politically conscious subject, subject agent, subaltern studies made the significant argument that the peasant lived and shared the same present as the elite. In other words, they were temporarily co-evil. And this, I think, is an important, a very important suggestion that needs to be worked further. The important lessons we learned also related to ways of uh, approaching, reading, understanding, and creating the archive. The point of departure in elementary aspects is how and when the peasant subaltern enters colonial records and how his presence is recorded. The book begins with that. Apart from assertions made explicit in the prose of counterinsurgency, which you've just heard analyzed by Nishant, so I won't go, yes. Apart from the uh, assertions made explicit in the prose of counterinsurgency, elementary aspects and subordinate studies induced us to read archival records along the grain against the grain and also in between the lines, you know, in order why they stated the things the way they did. You know? And again, I'm referring to Shahid Amin's very elegant expression, in order not to write like the judge, I, I will ask how the judge wrote. Language again, huh? we'll stick with language. In order not to write like the judge, I'll ask how the judge wrote. So. Uh, we, we learned how to read along the grain, against the grain, and between the lines in a way that the silences and gaps also told us a lot about the colonial administrators, maybe not just about the subaltern. So it is, it is I mean, we thought it was, an, uh, again, a very, very suggestive insight. Uh, Ajay has referred to Chandra's death as an instance of the different forms of institutional silencing and the judge's sifting and selection of facts in his effort to judge and pronounce that made the subaltern even more vulnerable. For me, Chandra's death was moving because it made explicit how legal prose and idiom changed a grieving mother sisters and other female members of the natal family of a young dead woman, female members who were trying to help her to abort, how legal prose and idiom changed them into criminals, delinquents. Once again, a close attention to language evokes an emotional world of grief and fear that transposes and transforms the fierce world of the courtroom. In addition to making meticulously critical use of the colonial archive, 
subaltern studies also insisted on the importance of what Parthoda has called the non-canonical, unsophisticated archive, an archive constituted by ballads, rhymes, and dog doggerels, chapbooks, almanacs, and local newspapers, songs and sayings, legends and faded postcards, and many more such elements, elements uh, that go into the making of what Gautamda called some years back in an interview, a living archive. And that's where he's talking about the importance of a almost faded postcard that came, let's say, from Bur Burma. And, and here again, another ne anecdote. Shahid Amin was, you know, was a co commentator for my History of Modern India. He liked the book, but that was not it. Attention to detail. He said, yours is the first book of its kind that mentions the penny post. Do you know how important it was for the migrants, you know, who are writing to their wives the, who can't even read? But just, I mean, I was struck that, you know, the first thing he focused on was that I mentioned the penny post and, you know, what changes it brought into the lives of, of these very, you know, these young women couldn't even write, you know, and they always came with a double thing so that the wife could send back a response and she had to go to someone, obviously, to, for, for him to read out what was written and then she dictated her answer and that, yes, so the unsophisticated and the living archive. Gautamda has called it a living archive, uh, that uh, nothing actually is unimportant uh, uh, when you're trying to dig up worlds which are difficult to have access to. So Parthoda imp also informs us in After Subaltern Studies that Chandra's death was based on and I quote, the snippet of a court deposition excerpted in a compilation of early Bengali letter writing. So here we have another instance of an ingenious use of the non-canonical archive. Chandra's death illustrates with great effect the nuanced layered narrations that a close attention to language and details can produce. I'll not give you, of course, I'm not here to give you a class on the history of evolution of subaltern studies. So I'll, you know, I'll, I'm focusing on the earlier part, but as we all know, it evolved. It was plural from the beginning, went different in different ways. But I'll just mention one more thing about this non-canonical, that they tried to make use of vernacular sources as much as possible. No, the local vernacular and also the classical. If you think of you know, elementary aspects, there's so sore, but there's also panini. And which would later be taken up in a major way in which in what Dipesh Da has called trying to revive, trying to revive um, dialogues with our earlier, uh, earlier thinkers and philosophers. Because he asks this very clearly, you know, that why is it that we do not find anything uh, embarrassing in talking, having a dialogue with a Hegel or a Marx or whoever, but we don't do it, you know? And, uh, and again, Gautamda has, has worked, uh, you know, has, has engaged with Obinabha Gupta. So that's the other part of it. Vernacular literature, as much as possible, in addition to all these songs, and not just songs, my, I, I'll come to my work now. How much time do I have? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good. So I'll, how, do, how did we then try and deploy these lessons and insights? And here, if you don't mind, I'll speak a little bit about my own work. I uh, was, uh, I worked on Orissa, on a, what used to be a marginal group, not anymore. And it's been, unfortunately, the main, the headquarters, it seems, has been taken over by the RSS as a very major uh, presence there, not so in the, the Sambalpur, Sonpur region. I was there, thank you, after several years later. Anyway, so how did we try and deploy these lessons and insights? First, the idea of resistance expressed you know, in, in different ways. Subaltern so studies, except for David Hardiman, hadn't really looked at religion, hadn't really engaged with religion seriously. So uh, I had very vaguely identified, you know, these, I'd said, 
adivasi cults and you know religious figures as my sphere of in, as my area of interest so gautam da calls me and he says you must look up this group why the intercolonial records and that's the interesting point the intercolonial records because apparently not apparently it did happen a very small group of ordinary men women and they had children with them entered the temple of jagannath in early march 1881 carrying a pot of rice with them they had eaten so you know it was like total sacrilege from the beginning but the point is they they claimed that they wanted to go and take out the idols and burn them so this became obviously law uh, law and order problem the other important thing how do they enter the first odia newspaper utkal uh, dipika uh, is reporting it on the 16th it was uh, it happened on the 2nd of march and he's saying now for about two weeks there's a rumor there's a terrible rumor that a small group of totally illiterate in, you know um, ignorant they call so call them you know adim you know primitive savage uh, people tried to enter the temple and do this take out jagannath the lord of the universe and if this rumor is true then lord jagannath and we oriyas we oriyas are in great danger so this is the report that drew is was mentioned in passing by anshalot eshman who worked on mohima dharma a group of german scholars had worked in the 70s and the book is called the cult of jagannath and the original tradition of orissa gautam da read this article and he says to me sorry uh, can anyone uh, everyone follow bengali kali kali odia pora shuru kore dao i said why <laughs> earlier he was trying to send me off to gujarat to work with david hardiman but anyway <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so he says kali kali odia pora shuru kore dao so i said why gautam da tumi mohima dharma er upor kaj korbe i said okay okay why because of this report rumor the way it was reported in he he couldn't read he said i cannot read the report in the utkar dipika but you have to read and tell me how this event is is reported it gets even more interesting the man the leader so called leader he's called dasaram he actually fell he just eaten he fell within the temple compound of course the the uh, police of officials uh, didn't uh, didn't charge anyone with the death of the man they said he he had fallen on a full stomach so that's why he died so yes it's very clear that the people you know the ritual functionary is the one who stand with sticks they were trying obviously they're trying to push them back and hit them so we don't know how there was a scuffle we don't know how he fell but all these people were acquitted but the group of course they were they were so dasaram it seems had gotten a sapnadesh he had got a got a command from mahima swami who was dead by then mahima swami to march to the temple of puri again i had a long discussion with professor binoy choudhury he says do you really believe in sapnadesh i said you know babu i mean you know it doesn't matter where why you know whether i believe it or not if these people believe you know i have to pay attention to it i said no 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 there was a serious discussion about historical truth historical fact veracity of historical fact so i'm just giving you these examples so that we you know we open up as i said or a lot of it has been working it out and i was influenced not just by subaltern studies obviously we were reading a lot of other material but the way the plural worlds you know of history history writing but before that what comes before that the access to those worlds you know how do we gain access what are the ways in which we approach these worlds these peoples so that what you know gayatri ji has said they do not get converted into our object of investigation and you know again we don't enter into that hierarchical relationship and these are you know these are warnings i received from the beginning 
The first time I was going off to Orissa, Parthoda says, you are born, a Bengali woman born and raised in Kolkata, you know, middle class, upper middle class background. What makes you think that you'll just go to Orissa, go to these remote places, talk to these people for a few days, and you think you'll get to understand everything about their life worlds? I was a little, you know, I was young. I was 20 something. I said, why is Patthoda doing this to me? You know, just before I'm, I was nervous. I was excited. But the importance, the significance of it again dawned on me years later. It was a warning precisely of this. You know, don't think that you go, you know, you go with your predetermined ideas, notions. You know? Go with open minds, go with, you know, so that you don't get into this idea of, you know, I've come from Kolkata. I know this better than you. And um, so this was another point. So what happens then? How do we work it out? This was religion. How did we understand it? How did we understand it? Religion, Shopnadesh, all of it, you know, is, is troublesome. And yet resistance. Resistance because they are not really interested in attacking Jagannath. Why? Because in this, in their legends, <clears throat> Jagannath Dev leaves the temple when Mahima Swami appears. Mahima Swami is an avatar. Another thing I cannot go into, the significance of the idea of Kali Yug and it being coming to an end with the appearance of an avatar. So, so they are talking about, the, there's a genre of texts in Orissa called, called Malikas, which are apocryphal texts that are uh, re associated with the Panchasakhas, the five medieval mystics. So from the 16th century on, you have these Malikas that are speaking of the end of the world in some kind through the appearance of an avatar. Yes, but the point then is, they, why did they go? Because they believed that with the appearance of Mahima Swami, who is the preceptor, but also an incarnation of the Absolute, Jagannath Dev had left Puri to become Mahima Swami's first disciple. But, but the people hadn't realized it. They hadn't realized it. They were like blind men and women. They're saying it because Mahima Swami had come and gone. But the Satya Dharma, it's Mahima Dharma, is for them the Satya Maha Dharma, had not made great headway. And in fact, it was in crisis after the death of the founder. He's, he's an incarnation, not meant to die. Okay. So this belief, they thought these very ordinary men and women felt that if they could march to Puri from Sambalpur region, it's impossible. These people had never been to Puri and bring out the idols and burn them, then people would realize that Jagannath Dev and the Trinity, they weren't really there. And that would enable the spread of the Satya Dharma. What has happened over time? Action and narration and how history gets written. Mahima Dharma has reworked its relationship with the cult of Jagannath. It has become almost an embarrassing footnote. So the people, as, as I say, who participated as actors, narrator, have been denied the, the power to narrate their own tale over time. I think I'll stop there. If you have questions, we can take them up later. Thank you very much. Uh, Rohan, can you hear us? Right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Oops. Professor Rock, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and now oh. we can see you. So go for it. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I think I would like to echo uh, Ishitadi's uh, remarks about the organizers, many of whom are uh, among my close friends. I'm very grateful for the invitation and uh, especially to the student volunteers and organizers who put this amazing event together. Uh, of course, I regret very much not being in uh, Kolkata in person uh, um, for my unique sort of personal circumstances uh, this year. Um, and um, I regret very much my inability to participate in what appears to be such amazing two days of fun-filled adda and intellectual reflections. 
uh, and um, so and something that uh, appears to what uh, an anthropologist that I'd read a few years back described as an epistemological carnival. Uh, what I would do now is perhaps place some of my um, sort of uh, my, my tribute to Professor Guha's work and the Subtle Stu Studies Collective by drawing on some uh, thoughts and um, anecdotes from my own uh, research on insects. So please bear with me if my talk appears to be a bit more self-indulgent than many of the other more profound uh, papers that you might have heard earlier uh, today. Okay, so, uh, but I also wanted to thank uh, Professor Roy uh, for your most generous introduction and Ishidadi for this amazing paper. Professor Roy, many congratulations on your new book, Changing the Subject. It appears to be really fascinating and I really want to engage with it um, uh, and uh, sort of in my own research. Okay, so in the vast overall of subaltern studies, uh, one seldom encounters insects. In Not at Home in Empire, Goha compares British colonial officials in India with ants, which carried quote, the grain and the honey of empire ever so obediently, incessantly to its queen. Such appearance of bugs in Kuka's writings is rare. Yet for me, interested in exploring how insects and the political domain are fundamentally entangled, the work of Guha continues to be inspirational. My work is part of the broader interest in examining, in De Sato's words, the presence of the innumerable and the infinite symbol in history. In that sense, the small voice of history, Guha's title for his 1995 Subaltern Studies chapter, anticipates the recently growing interest in insect histories and serves as an apt slogan for this scholarly turn. My work on insects is heavily influenced by the early Subaltern Studies agenda of bringing unsung categories, long condemned to what Dipesh Chakravarti has called the waiting room of history, into the forefront of analysis. The focus on insects extends the scope of subaltern studies beyond the human. It also extends mainstream animal history beyond its conventional focus on bigger four-legged non-humans. Of course, Guha's use of smallness in small voice of history is less literal than mine. Guha was thinking with marginalized groups while I'm looking at small insects and yet Guha's critical anti-statism informs my history of small creatures. Guha's critical anti-statism occurs at least two major forms. First, Guha reflects on how statist perspectives reduce marginal groups into silence and invisibility. In his own words, small voices are drowned in the noise of statist commands. Secondly, Guha indicates that even statist gestures towards inclusion reinforced exclusionary politics. And it is this second strand that is of immediate relevance to my talk today, with focus on termites, also referred to as white ants. I explore the politics of including small creatures as agents and full-fledged social organisms. I will show you that when state officials and scientists included termites in their political conversations, they did not necessarily uphold any emancipatory cause. And here I will make two arguments. First, uh, that the inclusion of termites in the official registers of the colonial state was closely tied to the material logic of state building. And second, that the termites were retained in these registers to reinforce dehumanizing discourses. Termites featured prominently in ideological justifications of empire, slavery, the caste system, and more recently, majoritarian nationalism. The smallness of termites attracted comment from 19th century observers. In 1856, for example, Dionysius Lardner, who was associated with the popularization of scientific knowledge in the English language, stated that termites were diminutive in size and less than a quarter of an inch in length, had a soft body protected by a thin and delicate skin. They felt threatened even by ants and retreated mostly to an underground and subterranean existence. In official correspondence in mid 19th century India, talk about the smallness of termites coexisted with reflections on their vigorous appetite for wood and paper. In the Dictionary of Economic Products of India, George Watt imagined that termites possessed forceps, while another observer compared them with bulldogs. 
It is with these attributes of being small and yet voracious that termites entered the official registers of the colonial state. Given their appetite, termites allegedly disrupted the networks of the colonial state. Officials complained that by being attracted to wood, termites damaged ships, military storage, railway slippers and bridges, telegraph posts, custom hedges and buildings, by being attracted to paper, termites damage administrative records, currency, promissory notes, books, and even dictionaries. Thus, termites were seen to be eaten into some of the material foundations of the infrastructure and the bureaucracy of the 19th century state in India. Colonial officials reflected on some of their characteristics that made these disruptors uncontrollable in the region. Termites were known to be disingenuous and misleading because the devoured only the core of wooden structures, leaving the facade of the exteriors intact. They were also believed to be uncontrollable, also because they were difficult to locate. India office records note that they were innumerable, recurrent, nocturnal, and underground organisms, and they worked as collectives. Termites reveal how colonial power, tiny non-human organisms, and materials intersected in British India. Whilst colonial officials acknowledged their vulnerability to termites, the retaliatory engine of the colonial state in turn deployed a range of materials and chemicals to repel or kill white ants. Therefore, metals such as copper for a while replaced wood to protect infrastructure from termites. Paper was routinely smeared with chemicals such as kerosene and corrosive sublimate, while wooden surfaces were brushed with creosote coal tar and arsenic. Apparatuses such as ant exterminator were devised that allowed poisonous gases such as sulfurous acid to be pumped into the conical shaped nests of termites. This dialectical relation between insects and things were thus more fundamental in shaping British imperial power in India than has been acknowledged in the historiography. This presence of termites in the material histories of state making provides the immediate background to their ideological abuses in the region. And it is to such stories that we now turn in the rest of this talk. In 1859, the British conservative newspaper, Morning Post, published an anonymous letter alleged alleging that termites caused substantial damage to agriculture in India. The correspondent lamented the absence of slave labor in the subcontinent, claiming to be one who has been a planter, sugar planter both in East and West Indies. They argued that this absence of slaves would frustrate the ability of plantation interests in India to compete with planters in countries such as Cuba, where slavery existed at the time. The author argued that ravages caused by termites to agriculture in India could only be compensated by the relentless hard work performed by slave labor because, quote, the sable African under coercion in a tropical climate is the most efficient cultivator when directed by the skill, enterprise, and intellect of the white man, unquote. It is striking that within two years of the mutiny of 1857, there were people actually enjoying print space in English newspapers who could misappropriate the termite problem in India to recommend the introduction of slavery in the region. The links between termites and British imperial ideology in India, however, were more enduring. British writers used termites as a metaphor for India and the Indians. In Orientalist descriptions, termites featured as a distinctive feature of Indian everyday life and landscapes. British colonial officials turned naturalists, such as Edward Hamilton Aiken, Aiken who wrote with the pseudonym Iha, highlighted that view that termites or white hands, as they were also called, were an inescapable aspect of living in the subcontinent. In 1881, Iha described India as a land whose soil is three fourths white hands and one-fourth earthy matter or stone. Termites and their several feet high habitations, also known as hills or nests, fascinated highest ranking British officials and their families. 
One of the sketches drawn in 1837 by Francis Eden, sister of George Eden, the Governor General of India between 1836 and 42, during a tiger shooting expedition in the Rajmahal Hills in Eastern India, depicted termite nests that were at least of the same size as the huts inhabited by local mahouts. Um, at the top right of the image, you can see uh, in very sort of uh, almost illegible cursory handwriting, it says white ants, nests and huts of the mahouts. In the left hand corner, you can see this uh, uh, almost cylindrical, but actually conical uh, shaped structure, which actually refers to uh, the white ants nest and the images with these human beings uh, right towards the, uh, at, at the at the front of the image refers to the huts and the mahouts. In this sketch, the nests and the huts dominated the landscape almost equally within the with the panoramic hills in the background. These visual the visual works asserted the prominence of these nests in South Asian landscapes by emphasizing the substantial sizes. Contemporaries in India and London also speculated about the creatures that inhabited these nests. In 1856, Lardner reflected contemporary anthropomorphic consensus when he claimed that the nests contained three categories of termites. The royal reproductive couple consisting of a docile king and a gigantic queen known for her phenomenal fecundity. The workers who carried out all activities ranging from foraging to constructing the nest. And finally, the soldiers who defended the nest from enemies. In similar anthropomorphic vein, these nests were frequently mentioned as a colony. British Indian officials considered these insect colonies sinister. Iha compared their insect inhabitants with defiant pre-medieval conquerors, such as the Ostrogoths and Vandals, rather than self-styled British liberal colonists of the Victorian era. Humorous descriptions of the queen of termite colonies by these authors were colored with misogyny and racism. D.D. Cunningham, surgeon to the Viceroy, referred to the reproductive female in the termite colony as a disgusting queen. Iha mocked the queen by likening her with a sausage, producing 80,000 eggs a day. He compared the queen of the colony of termites with the fat wives of the rebel anti-colonial Zulu king, Sitivayo. The termite colony was imagined as a subversion of the lofty ideals of Victorian culture and political stability that the British were promising to introduce in India. These anthropomorphic descriptions coexisted with British imperial claims that highlighted the intimate associations of colonized peoples in Africa and India with termites. Allegedly Indians indulged in frightful, childish and disgusting rich religious practices involving termites. H. Maxwell Lefroy, the imperial entomologist, highlighted that people in certain parts of India and Africa ate termites and that these practices were confined to savage nations beyond the reaches of civilization. Francis Galton noted in 1867 that termites' nests were used as cooking ovens in the wild countries of Africa, as distinct from the civilized and partly civilized nations. These suggested links between termites, the colonized people, and uncivilized practices fitted into the ideologies of the colonial state, which considered civilizing the uncivilized a primary justification for its existence. Hayden, one of the first entomology professors in North America and based at Harvard, reinforced these sentiments when he argued that termites or white ants <clears throat> symbolize the lack of culture. In an 1876 article published in the American Naturalist, Hagen wrote, white ants retreat step by step before an advancing culture. In Africa and India, where a century ago, immense antils were to be found near the shore, now under colonial rule, some days journeys inland have to be made to find them. This he called a retreat of white ants in front of a rapidly advancing culture. Iha, described termites as the foe of civilization, the gods of Indian life. The title of Iha's book, Tribes on My Frontier, an Indian Naturalist's Foreign Policy, first published in 1881, which contains a chapter on termites, is revealing. 
the inclusion of termites as one of the t- tribes on my frontier meant that the anthropologically uncivilized subjects inhabiting the peripheries of imperial control were deployed as a metaphor for the insect. The title deliberately conflates between the foreign policies of the British naturalist and the British imperialist, implying that the grasp of nature by culture, the domination of non-humans by humans, and the conquest of the so-called tribes by the apparently civilized were analogous processes. Backed by such ideological certitude, colonial officials described the destruction of termites evocatively as a great crusade, as a resistance, and as a war against a public enemy. The blurring of the lines between white ants and colonized Indians persisted into the final decade of colonial rule. In 1941, Percival Christopher Wren of the Wren and Martin fame, who was earlier at the Colonial uh, Indian Educational Service, wrote a short story called White Ants. This story describes Indian participants at the lower level of the colonial judicial apparatus as the real white ants. Wren suggested that these Indians and white ants were comparable because much like white ants, which destroyed the wooden pillars of suburban courthouses, Indians who were corrupt made the foundations of colonial law and justice dysfunctional. Therefore, while promoting imperial ideology, British authors viewed termites in asserting the inferiority of the Indians, anthropomorphic comparisons of termites with colonized peoples and dehumanizing descriptions of colonized peoples as uncivilized and even termite-like went hand in hand. And in this way, annoying termites and recalcitrant frontier tribes, destructive termites and corrupt Indians, termite queens and queens of African colonies could serve as worthy metaphors of one another. Much like British ideologues, South Asian nationalists have used the termite metaphor to articulate political disapprovals. In 1960, academic Ganesh Prasad turned the termite metaphor to its head to condemn British imperial exploitation. Others have used the termite metaphor to cancel South Asian social groups themselves. As we are aware, both Narendra Modi and Amit Shah have used the termite metaphor in recent years to castigate the Congress and Bangladeshi immigrants, respectively. Most of these ideological uses are grounded in material concerns that go back at least to the 19th century colonial context. The termites and parasites that destroy establishments from within, leaving the facade of the exterior intact. The termites are recurrent pathologies that can't be remedied superficially, but only through complete extermination. Meanwhile, in the 1940s, a new trend emerged in which South Asian authors began to idealize termites' nest as a model for humans to emulate. Of course, I'm not requesting you to read uh, the tiny alph- alphabets that appear on the screen. Um, it would appear to be a bit of an eye test, but it's just uh, as a placeholder. In December 1947, S.H. Prater, the curator of the Bombay Natural History Society, wrote an article on the termites. In a year marked by communal riots, Prater, who was also an elected representative of the Anglo-Indian minority community in the Bombay Legislative Assembly, argued that termites' nests could serve as a model for harmonious human existence. He suggested that harmonious life within the termites' nest was achieved through, quote, the ideals of communism fulfilled to the letter, unquote. Prater denied that there was a ruling class in the termites' nest, suggesting that every individual had equal status and that even kings and queens were sovereigns only in name. Prater observed that each individual, the queen, the king, workers and soldiers, worked uniformly and carried out their designated functions for common welfare and good. There was no difference in wages and each individual had their share in the community's products. This anthropomorphic description was revived in 1960 by Mithan Lal Runwal, the president of the Zoological Society of India. Runwal described the termites nest as nature's first experiment in large scale socialism. 
Revealingly, he combined this anthropomorphic discussion with a celebration of the caste system amongst insects. While there was a long tradition within natural history of referring to different categories of termites within termites' nests as castes, it is unlikely that Runwal was oblivious to the sociological implications of caste in the contemporary Indian context. He argued that culturally, the study of the termite society, which has a rigid caste system, is of the greatest interest to human social organization. He found it commendable that white ants ungrudgingly participated in a caste-based division of labor. He linked the supposed social harmony amongst termites with their voluntary participation in a rigid caste system, praising the fact that each category of termites functioned along the ways they were predetermined by birth. This is another example of how anthropomorphism and dehumanization coexisted in thinking about termites. Here we witness the anthropomorphic comparison of termites' nests with socialism. But Rulwald's comments are also dehumanizing because he not just naturalizes caste system among humans, but also suggests that the opponents of the caste system should abandon their protests and instead emulate insect societies unhesitantly. Guha's 1995 chapter, Small Voice of History, was part of his enduring critique of statist historiography, its exclusions and ventriloquisms. For Guha, smallness was a metaphor for the silenced in history. My talk today has instead adopted a more literal interpretation of smallness and has suggested that Guha's phrase, small voice of history, could be a slogan to frame emerging new studies that have the potential to question conventional historiography's bias in favor of the substantial and the sizable at the expense of the minuscule and the fragile. In that sense, Guha's visionary phrase anticipates recent trends, not just in insect humanities, but also in disability studies, as well as in the history of microscopic creatures. Of course, smallness was not an autonomous historical category. In case of termites in colonial India, the historical attribute of smallness existed alongside the qualities of being voracious, resilient, innumerable, nocturnal, um, and underground. It is with these attributes that termites entered the registers of the colonial state and soon became noted as a disruptive force. Unlike larger animals like tigers and elephants, termites were associated with disruptions that weren't spectacular and episodic but mostly surreptitious and routine. In this paper, I have traced how the sinister creativity of fascism converted a minuscule and everyday creature into a political metaphor for the harmful, parasitic, and the pathological. I would end by offering a couple of caveats here. At the heart of Guha's small voice of history is a critique of how state-centric historiography either silences or instrumentalizes the voices of the subaltern and in so doing undermines the full -fledged, their full-fledged agency. For Guha, acknowledgement of subaltern agency requires a rejection of conventional historiography with its penchant for coherent and chronologically linear narratives. Guha's programmatic, pro programmatic vision remains inspiration, inspirational even today. And of course, my effort this morning has been much more modest. But with my focus on termites, I offer a perspective that is distinct from current scholars who persist with the task of tracing the agency of groups that are unsung in conventional historiography. Agency, as we are aware, can be understood at least in two senses. First, agency is understood in an immediate and limited sense. For instance, the sociologist Bruno Latour once defined agency as the ability of simply modifying a state of affairs by making a difference. The second, a more profound sense in which agency is understood concerns the ways in which individuals relate to one another, establish solidarities, and organize collective action. I have shown in this talk that bureaucrats and scientists in India imagined termites as agents in both these senses. But I've also shown that such imagination was closely linked to the instrumental uses of termites in the justifications of empire, slavery, the caste system, and majoritarian politics. For Guha, status discourses 
undermined the agency of the subaltern by relegating them to a state of instrumentality. Termites urge us to think beyond the binary opposition of agency and instrumentality. Instead, as I have shown, acknowledgement of agency of termites could as well be implicated in their instrumental misappropriation in the aid of dehumanizing discourses. My second and final caveat speaks to the gurus in the overlapping scholarly fields of animal studies and science studies who have together contributed to what is known as post-humanities. Post-humanity scholars have urged on the need to go beyond the notion that attributes agency to particular species of humans or non-humans. They have instead claimed that in order to account for how actions happen, we should nuance anthropocentric notions of agency and intentions and instead focus on heterogeneous assemblages involving humans, non-human organisms, and materials. Both humanities and science studies literature have various expressions to refer to these heterogeneous assemblages, which together question human exceptionalism, ranging from Latour's use of, use of the word collectives to Donna Haraway's human-animal, natural-cultural, as well as multi-species alliances, to more recently Vassian Dupier's or Jospo. The science studies canon celebrates these heterogeneous assemblages variously, whether as models of radical defiance or as a model of shared survival in a deeply conflicted world. Almost each of these original science studies manifestos emerged in Eurocentric and North American contexts, and now a decolonial rethinking of the science studies canon is imminent. One of the ways of proposing a decolonial rethinking of science studies categories may lie in nuancing the rather optimistic, if not millenarian idea that heterogeneous post-human assemblages provides a redemption to many of the world's problems. Instead, a decolonial reading of science studies might be attempted by indicating, as I have tried to in this talk, how heterogeneous entanglements involving non-human organisms, materials, and political ideologies could reinforce justifications of dehumanizing practices, such as colonialism, slavery, caste, and majoritarian nationalism. Indeed, the future of science studies depends on how sincerely the post-humanities canon engages with critiques of dehumanization. It is here the legacy of Ramajit Guha, the Subaltern Studies Collective, and their pro-people perspectives on the violence of power and its limits in the majority world can be of great resource to the future of science studies. Persistent integration of the insights of subaltern studies and science studies would yield newer narratives that demonstrate how critiques of human exceptionalism and critiques of dehumanization could act as allies of one another. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. Thank you to. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? I think you can. Uh, so I think we have Opal 15 minutes for Q and A. So we can take one robust round of questions. Um, I'll collect a few hands. If anyone wants to start. Yeah. Um, is there a mic? Yeah, I think you can. Um, Rohan, can if if you can't hear, maybe you can. Oh, right. No, I can hear very well. Yeah. But you can you can hear us, right? Yes, Rohan. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Just speak on the mic. Hello. Hello. I think it's making a difference. Hello. Just put it. Try and put it on. Hello. It is on. Yeah, it's on. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, that was my question is for Dr. Bibra. Very interesting paper. I'm just. Can you hear? Them? Yes, I can. Yes, of course. Yeah. So I'm. I mean, I, it's not about uh, subaltern studies at all. My question. Uh, this insect metaphor. It's 
used in early modern European political theory as well. Erasmus uses it, you know, society of bees, etc., but not in a de dehumanizing fashion at all. So I'm, I was very interested in how that, you know, is transposed onto a colonial landscape and, you know, uh, with a colonial kind of insect and then it's turned inside out. I'm, I, I just wanted, I'm curious about with how pre-colonial non-British writers, if any at all, talk about termites and political corruption, um, if there's any instance of that. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Shall we, uh, I, I thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, shall we take a question at a time or take a bulk of questions, Srila, so that we can respond collectively? Uh, um, there's one more question, so should we just take that? Yes, and absolutely. Yeah. Uh, hello? Uh, so can you Hi. hear me? Absolutely. It, you, you're referring to me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, so my question is referring to the earlier part of your paper when you talk about how the termites possessed a danger to the material aspects as well as the bureaucracy of the British government, uh, one would also imagine that the relationship of the sort of harangued British officer with the termites would be somewhat similar to the relationship of the termites and the archivist. Uh, putting up this point, I would like to uh, uh, answer, uh, so, uh, question that uh, does this sort of draw analogies to the material aspect of the archive and also the sort of uh, sometimes explicit and sometimes implicit uh, power dynamic that sort of is present within the archivist or the, the person that is recording and the subject that is being recorded. So, yeah, that, that is um. Professor Banerjee Dubey has a question for Rohan. So maybe we'll sure. take her question and Rohan, you can respond and then we'll do another round. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Rohan, I'll try and be very, very brief. I was wondering from the examples you gave, whether or not, you know, in dehumanizing the human, the termites are not getting humanized. Caste system, think of it. Yeah, Rohan? Okay, yeah, very quickly, I know there's a dearth of time and uh, I, I think I the, I think fleetingly I saw one of my friends, Bodhida, on the screen as uh, uh, two of the uh, people were asking questions, so that's great. Hi, okay, very good to see you. Yeah, of course, very quickly, I've got, um, yeah, so Ishidadi, I'll respond to you first, I think. Yeah, of course, I mean, one of the ways, and first of all, thank you for that wonderful paper, that was lovely, I wish I could speak to you in person. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely, um, one of the sort of, you know, things that I'm trying to do here is to track how uh, these two processes of dehumanization and anthropomorphism, Ishiradi, are almost happening simultaneously. So in a way that lines between the human and the non-human are getting blurred, you know, this, uh, and what I'm saying is that while anthropomorphism per se is not inherently violent, this ascription of human attributes to the non-human, of course, uh, but when it gets tied to a parallel kind of historical process of dehumanization, then it gets appropriated um, into all sorts of, it gets into all sorts of problematic sort of uh, domains, and that's what is being critiqued here. So, yeah, so that's the limited point that I'm, I'm trying to make. Um, so, if there's a question of archiving and uh, termites is concerned, of course, you know, um, you know, of our experiences, isn't it? It's a fascinating question, something that uh, all of us have kind of can can relate to. Uh, from our own experiences of visiting archives, particularly the National Archives of India, my friends who are in the audience would know we have wonderful memories of spending time there together. Um, you know, there's these two kind of notes that one would say. One is like NT, which is like not transferred, which is very interesting, right? What happens to the status of records? when they're lost in between, right? From the from, from the bureaucratic world to the world of archiving, they're lost somewhere in translation, misplaced. What happens to this, you know, this interesting Laturian kind of duality between existence, non-existence, you know, that happens to those kinds of files. That's one story. And the other kind of narrative is that when the archive is a bit more confident about what happened to the disappeared files, they say they're being destroyed by ants. Now, it's very interesting because there's often a conflation in historiography, not in and in archiving, but not really in the historical sources of 
ants and termites, because termites are referred to as white ants, they're often conflated with ants, right? So when they're saying that, when, when archivists say that they're destroyed by ants, from my reading of contemporary sources, it appears to be they might be more trying to say that they were despite by termites or white ants. Um, so of course, there's an anxiety even in the 19th century of uh, amongst colonial officials of termites destroying not just these foundations of um, the 19th century colonial state, as I mentioned, of bureaucracy and anthropomorphism. Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, of, of infrastructure and bureaucracy, but also they were concerned about the ways that memories of colonial governance, you know, that are beginning to be uh, preserved, um, not just in archives, that's too soon in the 19th century, but official records, dictionaries, glossaries that are being put together about these times run danger of, of, of disappearing because of the onslaught from these term, on, onslaught of the termites. So there's that anxiety right into the heart of 19th century imperial state making of their efforts being forgotten and of the memories of the state uh, disappearing because of, 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 the, of the colonial state. And of course, uh, we historians also face innumerable problems because of that. So I guess the power of white ants, um, if one may put it that way, kind of, um, kind of plagues the concerns, not just of the 19th century imperialist or the post-colonial um, um, majoritarian nationalist, but also the historiographical concerns uh, of scholars such as us often plagued with archive fever. Um, we can, of course, extend the story beyond this to think about uh, uh, Frankenberg's comparison of white ants uh, with various kinds of um, peasant overlords in the 18th century eating into the foundations of the early company state, but that's a different story, I think. Uh, I'm asked this question a lot, and thank you again for that first question, that's brilliant, uh, um, kind of urging me to think a bit more about the pre-colonial because there's a tendency, and as early modernist scholars and our medievalist friends um, kind of uh, admonish us 19th century scholars a lot, that we often think that history begins in the 18th and early 19th centuries, which clearly wasn't the case. Um, but the honest confession is that, you know, every research begins at a particular moment. And in my case, I haven't quite adequately tracked the pre-colonial, early, early colonial or the medieval, which is a very, um, I hear you, it's a very, very um, meaningful uh, criticism. But at the same time, I think one can perhaps think a bit more with the question in the 19th century itself, but we think a bit more about the non-colonial, if not the pre-colonial, right? I mean, there are various ways in which even colonial 19th century sources, um, the mainstream ones, are, when they're talking about you know, material entomological solutions to the problem of termites, they're continuously talking about the input that they're receiving from the wisdom that they're getting from the bazaars. You know, Norman Shever gives tribute to the ways in which um, uh, in the bazaars, there's this widespread circulation of yellow arsenic, which is the antidote for preserving paper uh, from, from termites. Uh, there are also references in, in Indian Ant by Rothney, where he talks about, you know, the first experimentation of biological conservation uh, comes from Peru Malchetti, a South, basically a South Asian kind of trader who, who basically had discovered the art of, you know, putting sugar on, on timber uh, so that to attract ants which then in, in, in turn repel white ants, right? So that's kind of, this kind of using biological, one biological species to kind of um, kind of uh, stave and other, other forms of biological, spe biological species. These kinds of insights also drawn from South Asian wisdom. Of course, then there are these ba bazaar recipes for various kinds of subaltern oil, if you like, um, gondol fluid, uh, gurjan oil, which are kind of named in various mainstream entomological literature um, in the early 20th century, which provide sort of insights in the ways in which the non-colonial and their engagement with termites are very much being, very much on, and not just are being drawn upon by the helpless colonial state in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Maybe my answer was slightly on a tangent, it wasn't quite on pre-colonial, -pre but maybe thinking with the non-colonial also perhaps helps us uh, answer or perhaps address the question um, uh, or it is, helps me begin answering that question to a certain extent. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prathma, and if there's a line, Upal. And maybe a last question, then we can take three together. Hi, Rohan. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that paper. I'm just trying to understand your argument. So 
just take these as my trying to think with you. Uh, it seems to me that the history of anthrop anthropomorphism is very long, right? From the time that there has been human history, there has been anthropomorphizing of various kinds. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the history of brutalization, rendering into brutes, what you're calling dehumanization, has a long history across cultures and periods of time, using other humans as beasts of burdens, as objects, as worms, vermin, pest, you know, uh, termites. I, and I get that what you are suggesting is that something changes in this history at the moment of colonial capitalist modernity, which is an overall, uh, 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 you know, a, a very different kind of relationship to the planet as such and all its aspects from rocks to minerals to animals to insects to microbes to viruses and so on and so forth. Uh, now, that's that specific moment, uh, I'm not sure can be re-narrated as a history of uh, dehumanization stroke anthropomorphization. Because that, I think, is not a colonial, specifically colonial imperial history. Uh, so, so then, if if one goes, if thinks in that vast scale, then two different kinds of questions come up in my mind. The first is the kind of debates that happen, uh, that, that are, for instance, happening with Dipesh's, uh, you know, uh, the climate of history uh, and the response to that by Ian Bocom, which is history at four degrees Celsius, where the question is whether history as a mode of knowledge can accommodate, uh, can actually write, uh, you know, can history survive the, 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 it's not a question of including from small voice to history to microbial agents. It's the question whether history can, just including does not really work. Does it change history as a craft, as an art, as a mode of knowledge? So that's, it seems to me, the debate that's happening in, in the kind of planetary moment. Um, somewhat, the resonance I find in that debate with the debate with the subaltern studies moment is that the same question of was being asked when, when Ranajit Guha is saying that maybe history is not enough that we have to exceed history. Uh, and if we have to finally arrive at a place where the subaltern and I can meet. So my feeling is that you are choosing to stay in his, within history as it exists methodologically, craft-wise, writing-wise, and stay with the idea of inclusion. So now that, uh, you know, subaltern peoples, everybody agrees that subaltern peoples must be included. Let's also include not just the horse and the elephant, but also the microbial and the viral. Uh, so I'm, you know, so I'm kind of getting stuck here. I'm facing an impasse, as it were. So I just want you to kind of help me think through this a little better. Uh, Upa? Um, we have a few few hands now, two more, so, and then uh, Rohan and Shikari, yes. uh, Thank but, you for but, but, the paper. Sorry. Oh. Uh, then, okay, fine. I, I, I thought, Upal, you're asking me a question because, Ishida, uh, in other words, I would have tried to respond to Prathumadi first because it's already such a rich and complex kind of question. I would lose my train of thought. But, of course, if you're asking it to this question, Rishidadi, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. We finish this round and then maybe the speakers can respond. Yeah. Uh -huh. So Ishitadi, I was thinking about uh, this question which you have very raised very centrally in your presentation, and you referred to not only your learnings from Ranojit Guru, but so many anecdotes. You also referred to your conversations with the members of the original collective. 
Gautam Bhadro, Partha Chatterjee, for example. So I was thinking that, you know, did you find in your different conversations with them, you know, uh, different ways with dealing this, dealing with this question that Binoy Chaudhary asked you, that, uh, you know, if they believe, and what your response was, if they believe, I have to take it seriously. I'm thinking that you know, uh, in Guha, there is a certain way of taking it seriously, uh, which is perhaps not shared by many of the collective. You know, maybe, you know, Partha Chatterjee's work, um, using Althusser to talk about religion, and Guha's work using Levi Strauss to talk about religion are very different ways of approaching this question of whether and how to take their beliefs seriously. So what you gained out of these different engagements within the collective on the question of religion is something I would like to hear from you more on. Yeah, yeah. lovely question. Um, I, I, who, who, was, who was next? No, you were next. Okay. It's again for uh, for Ishita, because I think what 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 you gave us is such an interesting way of thinking about the transmission of knowledge generationally, and I wanted to invite you to reflect a little bit since you men mentioned Binoy Babu, you mentioned Gautam Bhadri, you mentioned economic history, and I could not but think about a rule of property, and if you could just share a little bit about your experiences of reading a rule of property and how it used to be positioned for you as a student of history because I mean in my head there's a connection between that and, and later Guha works but since I never actually was able to attend master's classes in Calcutta University I was very sick and missed most classes at the time I'm very very curious also because uh, Upal Shukana and I and several others, we've been involved in this archiving project of Residency College. And I think what you offered is invaluable because it, it it's actually about how um, over generations, you know, from uh, all of us remember the dedication of rule of property. And I want to ask you to just reminisce a little bit about being a student in the economic history seminars and reading it with, with, with these folks. Um, okay, Rohan, do you want to oh, yeah. respond? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much for that profound question, Prathamadi. I think it's the first time you and I are having a conversation, so um, that's very exciting um, for me. Um, <clears throat> um, of course, um, uh, very generous, you referred to the fact that you wanted to think with me. So I, I, I'm using this opportunity as an, as an opportunity to think in, thinking aloud in, in response as well. And without making any claims of making any kind of definitive remark, these are very much um, sort, of my, sort of like modernity, which all critiquing my thinking is in progress. Um, so then I'll just briefly make two uh, remarks, I think. Um, in terms of explaining what I'm trying to do, since you refer to sort of uh, Dipesh Das' work, um, and in terms of the critique of history, per se, uh, more generally, and which is part of the larger kind of subaltern studies baggage, of course, beginning with Ranjit Gua's work, but also through uh, much of the later recent works as well. Uh, <clears throat> one of the obvious references which I cite, <clears throat> which I cite quite a lot, and in think with think with is of course <clears throat> Dipesh Das' uh, minority history subaltern pasts. And I think in that sense, I think uh, insects more general, but particularly termites, um, could be read as one such category um, that defines the disciplinary history from outside. So this is something that cannot be sort of reduced within the more anthropocentric in this case, or the more kind of conventional sort of styles of practicing uh, history. So in that sense, of course, one could make an argument or perhaps develop an entire paper thinking about how it is impossible for conventional historical craft to think with the category of termites. Uh, this is a critique that I acknowledge, I've grown up with, but I think uh, as a historian, uh, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a historian, so therefore in a way, up alongside that critique, and I'm also trying to develop what kinds of histories of insects in this particular case 
is still possible to think about, right? So that's that's the project. <clears throat> and in that case, I think the irony that I'm developing, <clears throat> I've not written about a history of history of insects, right? I'm not engaging into a historiography of insects. And that would be much more comparable to the subaltern studies project. Here, the question of inclusion, the irony that I'm developing is that, of course, I'm talking about insects in a way history, insects are unsung. To that extent, perhaps I'm in the business of including and hitherto unsung category in history, you're very correct. But the critique that I'm offering here is the politics of inclusion when scientists, naturalists, colonial thinkers, educators are invoking the category of insects or perhaps including termites in their political conversations. Uh, to what end? Uh, it, it, so how can we critique those acts of in inclusion? Or how can we think about writing a critique of those acts of inclusion or providing full-fledged agency to insects? I think so that's the irony. So as a historian, I'm in that business of thinking about insects and how that can how they can be part of, of history writing. On the other hand, I'm also thinking about the dangers and the irony and the violence associated with the history of providing inclusion to categories. So I, I, I think I'm, and that's that's the that's the subject of my analysis. If I was a if I was writing a kind of history, if it was a historiographical comment on history of insect writing, which is of, of which very few exist at the time, at the moment, I think uh, my argument perhaps would be slightly different. Um, to go back to the question of climate histories at the moment, uh, I think it's. The literature is so vast, it's very difficult to pinpoint a particular moment and critique and offer a kind of a contribution to that conversation. But I think uh, more generally over the past uh, decade or so, I think almost there's been a kind of a kind of a debate about thinking about, you know, climate change and thinking about, you know, thinking beyond the human on the one hand uh, and the ways in which those kinds of literature have often urged us to go beyond conventional sociological categories of capitalism, imperialism, let me say other historical categories or maybe chronological categories, the histories of slavery, for example. The challenge here for us, I think, is to think along both these kinds of temporalities. And I think, of course, Dipesh's work in terms of manifesto has provided that. And I think I'm trying to also try to therefore combine, trying to think about, again, build up that irony, whether it's possible to think about uh, literature that values the voice of the people, to put it bluntly, and uh, scholarly literature that urges us constantly to think beyond human exceptionalism. You know, what kind of, you know, kind of uh, narratives can that sort of um, difficult conversation emerge? What I have tried to do is perhaps, in my way, kind of a beginning uh, of, of, of a process. I'm sure others would take that to much more creative and innovative ways. Um, finally, the profound comment about the specificity of the colonial moment and the, if you like, the more general, you know, universality of the simultaneous operations, if you like, you said brutalization on the one hand and anthropomorphization on the other. Um, and what specific colonialism is, uh, is about, you know, I, th I think specific to the kind of project that I'm doing, it's really at the preliminary stage of the work in, in, the, in the literature. Of, of 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 thinking within such humanities, um, I think one can only make a beginning with one's own kind of chronological context and then think, to think at the more generalized kind of way. But if what I'm trying to do uh, has resonances uh, to historical periods across uh, chronological periods, uh, I take that as a criticism, but also as a compliment. Thank you. I'll try to be very brief. I'll, I'll address uh, Rochona's question first because she wants me to go back to my master's days and you're speaking of my, yes, which followed soon after, but the center, the Jodhunath Sharkar Bhavon. That is where, you know, it was a different world. Anyway, Rochona, I can't really answer you uh, very well because uh, I left, as you know, I mean, what appealed to more me more was social history. What I remember vaguely, and the other things that you mentioned, you know, Babu, I had to, thanks. We, the two texts on which he gave us, you know, individual assignments, I mean, assignments on each chapter, Bailey's uh, Rulers, Townsmen, and Bazaar, 
and uh, elementary aspects. Quite remarkable. This tells you something about, you know, in an economic history special paper, you know, it tells, tells you something about, yes, Binoy Babu. The, the other thing is we did re, uh, read rule of property, but only in, it was like how the importance, how do you get to the importance, the role of ideology in, uh, you know, in, in, in formulations of, uh, let's say, revenue settlements. That is how, what I vaguely remember, very vaguely remember. So I can't really, I mean, I have to go back to it now. Uh, I'm in Kolkata, I'll see if I can dig up my MA notes. <laughs> it was, it was probably Vinoy Babu, but as I said though, yeah, probably Vinoy Babu. But we started with Dharma Kumar and uh, yeah, so it was probably Vinoy Babu. And the other person who didn't come in, um, because it's not about Ashindash Gupta. So we, we were really lucky. We went to National Library on Saturdays because he was then the director. Uh, and uh, yes, but uh, we will, yes, 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 yes. It was, it was Vinoy Babu who taught us, not, not Gautamda. And the other thing I wanted to mention, and didn't because of lack of time, through Gautamda, we got another introduction indirectly to Sir Walton's studies because he would begin by, you know, he gave us, again, written assignments on Habib's thesis on the decline of the Mughal Empire. And we learned the problems of using, loosely using European categories such as feudalism, capitalism. And that then indirectly ties to subordinate studies argument, which is not talked about as much, of separating the history, let's say, you know, from the history of global capital. Because Gautamda said, it's Chotantro Dhara. You know, he gave an example, <laughs> the first class of RTP, research training program. He said, to me, I'll, I have to say this in Bengali, Tomar Bhava Ma University Poriyats, and so that is what you wish to do, right? To me, it is. Calcutta, Kolkata Vishu Vidala, it is a hard day. Take a year, Jodi, to me, Bolo, that to me, cano university, Vishu Vidala, and Master Hor Kotha Bhapchona, Shiki Kichu Bujbe, Tomar Prashnota. So it is like forcing, you know, the, why, you know, why think of what happened or didn't happen in India in terms of capitalism. And he was referring to, of course, potentialities of, um, uh, of, of capitalist growth. So, so that's, that's the other part. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm digressing, but I, I felt I had to, yeah. yeah. So, and, and the other interesting thing is Borun Babu came after that. Huh? And he, he had to teach us uh, feudalism. And he says, Gautam ki pori eche, Irfan Habib je bhool sheta chhara Gautam ki pori eche. Sorry, to come back to Upal, another person I must mention, Hitesh Babu, the one who was most excited when I decided to work on Mohima Dharma. One was Gautamda, of course, and he introduced me to Hitesh Babu. Unfortunately, he died within a year. I mean, I'd just begun my research. And the, the difference in opinion, Omiyo Bhakti was then the director. Omiyo Babu, I mean, I don't know if you, any of you have gone through those uh, long interviews, long table in the seminar room of Jodhunath Bhavan, which, and, and there were about the entire faculty plus people came from ICSSR Delhi, okay? So it was like terrifying. There's one chair for you. And then you have all these people sitting there. Amir Babu was there as a director. He had his back to me. He said, Dharma, Dharma, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I Interesting. Interesting. Huh? Anyway, so uh, I agree with you. Ranajit Babu, I think he accepts it. And yet I feel it's almost like a, a romanticization. He almost comes to saying, although they critique it, that, you know, the peasant's world is this pre-modern kind of world suffused with religiosity. So with Ranajit Babu, I did not have a long discussion. This time he did ask me what I was working on. He was happy that I'm working on Orissa and, you know, Mohima uh, Gautamda again took me to meet him, but he was more interested by then sort of when I had decided to get married, he knew sort of very well. So he was more interested. It's very, very interesting, Bangla. He told me, Ki korche Dilli te, Kolkata hai chole aste bolo. Balochela, I said, you know. <laughs> so, 
doesn't matter. This time, he did ask me what I was working on, and I, I told him, Sharla Dash and Mahabharat. He was happy with that. He was happy with that. Um, but uh, to go back to your question, Parthoda again was not really as interested. I did not have a discussion with him over this Shapnadesh. What he was more interested in was the rumor spread when I mentioned the, you know, the report in uh, Utkal Dipika. So, yes, it was a variety of opinion. Uh, Parthoda was a little uncertain, I would say. He was, he was very encouraging to the extent that Gautam that took me because in RTP there was nothing on, you know, Durkheim and stuff. And he said, oh, to the kaj korbe mohima dharmo niya amade to Durkheim to khai mei bare nei. So he said, Korano jetei pare. So Gautam uh, said, ke porabe, ami porabo. I literally, mane parthoda, tokhon kar parthoda, I don't think you realize. I was like terrified. Mane class shesh holei kato khone ghar theke berovo. <laughs> because, <laughs> so, but I have had this very rare opportunity of, you know, doing elementary aspects and, and a bit of Levi Strauss with Parthoda. It got interrupted because he would be traveling. He was very busy, but yes. But uh, no, I mean, yes and no. Yes and no. There, were, there was mixed response. When the book came out much later, I think the fact that I, you know, focused so centrally on Koli Juk, in understanding these life worlds, the significance. I think that is when they were really excited. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking both the speakers. Roy, I'll just announce the end of today's very enriching session. And uh, remind all that we start at 10 a.m. To tomorrow um, with uh, a promised lecture by Professor Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak. It's still a promised one because she has uh, uh, told us that will be sent a pre-recorded message, uh, a pre-recorded talk so uh, we are yet to receive it honestly so uh, but uh, uh, we have been in touch and we do hope to have it by tonight but, and and that's what we start with tomorrow uh, f uh, following which we have plenty of very exciting papers lined up um Shorab dubey projit bihari mukherjee in the first session after professor Spivak, and then prothama banerjee bodhisattva core uh, in the next in the post lunch session Following which we have a session where uh, uh, Raghavendra Chattopadhyay would talk about. He was uh, one of Ranajit Guha's PhD students. Many of, in this audience might not know that. So he'll talk about uh, his, you know, his experience of Ranajit Guha as a teacher, supervisor at more uh, an advanced level of uh, academic work. And in that panel, we also have papers by our students. Um, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, they in their own way have tried to write something on Guha. And the final panel is again a discussion with students by Gautam Bhadro, which I'm sure will be an exciting one. And they will be talking more about, I guess, uh, the uh, writings in Bangla of Rajit Guha. Uh, so lots to look forward to tomorrow. 10 o'clock we meet. Uh, thank you everyone for No, prepone korbon. But there's no, see, the thing is, it's, um, there's, there's no way to know that beforehand. So there, it's, a, it's, it, it, to, uh, uh, she will do it, but till now it's a spectral condition. <laughs> If I may be allowed to crack that joke anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, thank you so much, speakers, Chair, Rohanda, Ishidadi, Professor Roy. Thank you for uh, sparing your time and thoughts for us. Thank you, thank you.